This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 1st, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why some in the Alaska legislature keep pressing for PFD cuts even when other options are better for the overall Alaska economy and for Alaska families. And second, the concerns we have about raising oil taxes. Our third issue this week is why we think changes are needed to SJR 6, the governor's proposed spending cap. We ran out of time before discussing it on the show, and we will bring it back next week to take it up then. And now, let's join Michael. We were just talking about kind of the different philosophies in the legislature, and it is amazing to see how all these different things play out, and we might try and and jump into that well we should jump into it right now because it kind of plays into his number one issue pfd cuts is obviously one of the tax that these people are taking and that quote john uh, excuse me that quote uh, brad from john coghill to me is just the most uh, amazing where he's basically saying he and both he and von imhoff are both basically saying um it, it's that constitutionalizing the dividend or you know paying a full dividend whichever you know, direction you want to take it from, forces the legislature to give up budgetary flexibility, meaning they can't raid the piggy bank anymore. And and that's kind of what the bottom line is. Yeah, it's um, the PFD issue constantly uh, amazes me for, for this reason. Back when we started getting into this situation, really focusing on the fact we were in the fiscal situation, the governor had ICER the Institute of Social and Economic Research do a study uh, about what the options were and what the effects were. Uh, ICER did the study. Uh, It is often cited sort of halfway by the legislature for one of the conclusions, but then they go go and ignore another set of conclusions. What ICER did in in 2016 was analyze six different options for generating revenue, uh, uh, additional revenue to, 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 to meet the fiscal situation the state was facing. The six were a progressive income tax, a flat rate income tax, which is different, slightly different than the, than the one you and I talk about uh, because it has a different base, but nonetheless, a flat rate income tax, a sales tax, two different types of sales taxes, one with, with a lot of exclusions in it, uh, one with uh, uh, fewer exclusions in it, uh, and then a statewide property tax. Um, th- those were the first five, and then the sixth, was a PFD cut. And ICER went through and analyzed the impact both on inca- income and on jobs of those six options uh, and, and what the effect of those would be. Right. Uh, the conclusion ICER reached in the two- 2016 study, and it's been there, and ICER has not, not, not wavered from that at all uh, in the subsequent two years, and other economists have looked at it and agreed with it. ICER's conclusion was the impact of the PFD cut falls almost exclusively on residents, and it is highly regressive, so it has the largest adverse impact on the economy per dollar of revenues raised. Of all the six options, it had the largest adverse impact on the economy of all of the six options. They also concluded in a, in, in the, in a study that they, that they did the next year, which was focused on, which was used the, used the data from the 2016 study and focused on the effect on Alaska families, they concluded that a cut in PFDs would have by far the costly, would be by far the costliest measure for Alaska families of all those six options. 
they look at it, they, they analyzed the six options, and they concluded both in terms of the impact on the overall Alaska economy and, uh, on, uh, and, and on the impact on Alaska families that cutting the PFD would be the worst of the six options. And just again, that's concluding that a progressive income tax, a flat rate income tax, a sales tax with, with, with bigger, more exclusions, sales tax with less exclusions, and a statewide property tax, all of those would be better for the Alaska economy, none of them would be great. I mean, you're taking money out of the economy, but in terms of how you take it out of the economy and the impact on the economy, those other five measures would be better for the Alaska, the overall Alaska economy and would be less costly for Alaska, Alaska families than the PFD cut. Nonetheless, in the, in the three years since that study, <laughs> First, the governor in 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 his in the first year the, the, of his uh, uh, that they addressed the uh, the new revenue measures uh, cut the PFD through veto, and then the legislature in the last two years have used has, have used PFD cuts as the sole measure of raising new revenues. And many, I mean, you just went through it. Many, John Coghill, Natasha von Imhoff, and others are pushing to use exactly that same approach again. In the face of a 2016 study that they give a lot of time to for, for other purposes, in the face of the 2016 study that said cutting the PFD had the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and was by far the costliest to Alaska families. Why are they doing that? Why would they do that? Right. If, if they're concerned about the Alaska economy, if they're concerned about Alaska families, which they say they are, John will say he is. Natasha will say they are. Of course, we got to look after the Alaska economy. Why are they doing that? Why are they using the 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 option that they that the economists, the governor hired, and the economists that they praise for other purposes? Why are they doing the very thing that those that the economists say has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy? And there's only there, there, there's just one there's just one thing that I've been able to parse out from listening to them, talking to them, reading what they write, listening to what they say, the one consistent thing is, oh, but it would have, all these other options would have a hard impact on the top 20%, would have a hard impact on Alaskans that, that fall into the top 20% of the income bracket. And so PFD cuts, it, 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 which is the best of the options for the overall Alaska economy, is the best of the options for Alaska families, PFD cuts have the lowest impact on the top 20%. We publish chart after chart after chart after chart on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page that show the impact of, of PFD cuts by income bracket and show that they are extremely low, have an extremely low effect on the top 20%. And a huge effect, an increasing effect and a huge effect on middle-income Alaska families four times, middle-income Alaska families four times the impact on, well, five times, depending upon the family size, uh, on five times the, the impact on the top 20 percent and, and 10, 15, 20 times the impact on the lowest 20 percent than they're having on the top 20 percent. And, and over and over and over again, and when you listen to Natasha von Imhoff uh, talk about why she doesn't want to use any of those other options, it is that there would be an impact on the top 20% uh, of those other options. So we have, we have a state government, we have state legislators who are driving public policy, who are driving economic decisions made by the state, not on how it, on, on how it impacts on the overall Alaska economy, or how it impacts on the average Alaska family, we have them driving all of the state fiscal policy based on how it impacts the top 20%. Right. Well, and Von Imhoff has actually been out, come out and said that her main concern is driving all these people who make good money out of the state, which, I mean, if that's your primary concern, I mean, I think shouldn't it be on the overall Alaskan economy? Won't those things come and go and ebb and flow based on the overall economy? But she seems just dead set on making sure that big money doesn't leave the state. Well, and and there's no demonstration that the big money would leave the state. I mean, you have you have people who occasionally say, "Yeah, I'd leave the state if you know if I had to pay an income tax." 
Really? Any income tax? You'd leave the state. Well, that's not true. So I mean, so the question is, is there a, a, a point at which the tax burden would be su sufficient to drive people out of the state? We've had no, dis and that may be true, and that may be a point at which we need to, you know, stop taxing, stop raising revenue. But we've had no discussion about that. They've never had ICER in and said, could you do an analysis, or any economist in, could you do an analysis about what the point is, the income tax point, at which people would leave the state? Yeah, the break even, and, and right? They don't want to know the answer to that because they've just damn concluded that we're not going to we're not going to tax the top twenty percent. You know, you know what's really fascinating about this is I, you know, people talk about conflict of interest. Who's the wealthiest member of the of the Alaska legislature? Who would an income tax affect the most? Who would any of these other options, the other five options, affect the most? It's Natasha von Imhoff. Right, right. Well, talk about self-interest. I mean, yeah. And, <laughs> and so she's making the decision. Get this, folks. She's making the decision about what financial, what fiscal alternative to select. And she's and and she's looking at a tax bill that she would have to pay if if they chose one of the other options, and essentially avoiding a tax bill. If the, if she chooses PFD cuts, she's got she and she's given as co-chair of Senate Finance, she's given the power to have huge influence over that process. Well, guess which one she's picking? The one <laughs> that doesn't pick, matter, yeah. <laughs> she's picking the one that doesn't affect her. Guess where she's trying to drive the debate? She's yeah. trying to drive the debate to the one that doesn't affect her. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding. That ICER said in 2016 very clearly the impact of the PFD cut falls almost exclusively on residents, and it is highly regressive, so it has the largest adverse impact on the economy per dollar of revenues raised. Natasha doesn't care about that. She cares about the impact on her family, and she's positioned herself in the state senate and in state government to, to, to have heavy influence on that outcome. You know, people talk about the conflict of interest that some of the senators have on oil issues. Good right. Lord. <laughs> yeah, you want to talk about one that really affects your pocketbook directly. I mean, if you're making a million dollars and you're talking about a 3% difference, that's real money uh, at a million dollars a year. I mean, it's not a, not an easy thing to do. And the alternative, Michael, that we talk about, which is a flat tax, the alternative, we're not trying to, I mean, some people talk about a progressive income tax, and a progressive income tax would basically be paid by the top 40%, of, of, of Alaskans, and the bottom 60% would pay very little. It would be the flip side of, of PFD cuts. Um, it, would push the cost to, it would push the cost to somebody else. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a flat tax, which would affect all Alaska families the same. Everybody would pay 3% of their, of their adjusted gross income or 2% or 4%, whatever the number is to raise the revenues that, that – the, that are necessary to close the fiscal gap, um, and and that's all we're talking about. We're not talking about making the the uh, the top twenty percent pay more. We're talking about the top twenty percent paying exactly the same percent of their income that the bottom uh, twenty percent pay well, uh, of their income. But hypothetically, you are asking them to pay more because right now, for example, von Imhoff is paying 02 percent of her income. And you're asking her with a flat tax, which is equitable. I mean, I think we've all agreed on this program that it's equitable compared to everything else is a lot more than that 0.2% that she's paying in the <laughs> dividend taking. So, I mean, I can see why there's reticence to even discuss any of these other things. And, of course, taking the moral high ground as the Republicans are doing and saying, oh, we're protecting you from a tax. We're just taking your dividend. That's like saying, we're protecting you from the axe murderer. Pardon us while we twist the knife in your gut that we're holding. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it's about at this point. It is. And and we're not, I mean, the point was with Moore, and I understand Von, I understand von Imhoff's response, but the point about Moore is we're not asking the, the top 20% to pay any more than the bottom 20%. Right. We're not asking that. We're not trying to gouge them like they're gouging the middle and lower income families. We're not trying to say you need to pay more because you earn more. We're simply saying pay the same percent across the board. And you know what would happen with that if we if we did that? 
everybody would have skin in the game in trying to bring spending down. Right. The way the way it is right now with PFD cuts, Von Emhoff is able to go off and say, oh, I don't think we ought to cut K through 12. Oh, I don't think we ought to cut the university. Oh, I don't think we ought to. Because she doesn't pay for any of it. Right. Everybody <laughs> else is footing the bill. Right. So she's all, yeah, OK, I got it. I got it. <laughs> she gets to go around. She gets to go around and say, I'm here to support spending. I'm a good guy. And you get. And you get letters to the editor, and you get people who say, oh, my senator, my senator's out there supporting us. She's supporting spending. Well, of course she is. Yeah. She doesn't have to pay for it. Exactly, exactly. Oh, my gosh. It sounds like you're getting as wrapped up as I was. Right, so tell me how you really feel about this. Because... <laughs> it's, she just drives me. I mean, it. The, 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 the sanctimonious attitude she has about this. Oh, I know. Is is part of what really drives me over the edge. I mean, it's like, are you not aware of what you're saying? Or yeah. are you so aware that you figured out you're just going to keep your mask on and, and just, you know, just stumble right through it or just, you know, plunge right through it. Right. The hypocrisy of it is what gets me. I mean, just looking me in the face and telling me how much good they're doing for us again while sliding the knife out and saying, oh, I'm sorry, did that hurt? Uh, you know, I mean, just, we didn't notice. We, did, we didn't feel anything, so we didn't think that that would hurt. Um, it, it's insane. Uh, we got a couple. I'm sorry, we got a couple of questions here in the chat room, Brad, that I thought we'd take a minute to uh, sure. to address. Charlie says, last week when Brad was on, I commented that the legislature was going after the PFD because it was the only easy source of money. He said there were alternatives. Can he say more about those? Didn't ICER, don't ICER options take a year or two to generate money? I've kind of consolidated two of his questions, but it's kind of they're related there. So. So the answer to that is a flat tax could be a flat tax is a good option. A flat tax could be implemented right now. Uh, the legislature could pass it right now, make it effective uh, for uh, this year. It's based upon adjusted gross income uh, uh, on the federal income tax line. So all you have to do is take your adjusted gross income on the federal income tax line, take it times whatever percent the legislature sets uh, and pay the money. That's not that's not all that difficult. Um, and and the audit, the setting up an audit function wouldn't be all that difficult either. Just check whether you've taken the right percent of AGI. Um, you could start uh, withholding based upon that now. You could you could set up withholding schedules based upon that now. I don't think it takes that long. Uh, if you wanted to do a more complicated tax like the House had proposed a couple of years ago, uh, which was a graduated income tax, uh, progressive income tax. Uh, uh, in part based upon uh, federal income tax uh, paid, but but with a lot of uh, a lot of other exceptions to it, then yes, that would take a while to set up. But a very simple tax uh, based upon adjusted gross income, uh, a flat tax based upon adjusted gross income, I don't think uh, takes that long uh, takes that long to set up. You can also take withholding out of the out of the if you if you're concerned about cash flow, you can take. Uh, withholding out of the permanent fund dividend subject to um, subject to recoupment uh, in the in the subsequent tax year. So I I'm not seeing implementation being a significant issue. I would say that that I have heard that raised as an issue, particularly at the time the House had come up with its um, uh, issue or pr its proposal a couple of years ago, um, and and people said, oh, it would take a couple of years to do. Uh, we didn't do anything at that point. So now, you know, people are saying, well, it'll take a couple more years to do and a couple more years to do. As long as we don't do it, we never get to it. Right. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to take that long to implement it. Would an income tax, uh, Chris says, increase expectations in government services? Um, I mean, I think Hammond kind of addressed this. It wouldn't, I don't know if it would necessarily increase expectations, but it would make people more aware of and probably the government more accountable to the people based on that income tax. I don't think you can get any higher level of expectation of government services than you have in Alaska right now. I mean, people expect K through 12. That's what all these, that's what all these presentations are, you know, people are rolling out to go to these presentations to make the point. We expect K through 12. We expect three universities. We expect Medicaid. Uh, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to envision a situation in which people would expect more. What I do think it would do is it would tie the cost of government services more to individuals. People would understand, oh crap, now I got to pay 3% of my income, my adjusted gross income, 
in order to pay for Alaska public services. You know, I get reactions when we discuss this on Facebook and Twitter and other places, and I discuss it with the public. Uh, we get reactions of people say, well, that's too much. Damn right, it's too much. It ought to be. It ought to be less. We need to cut government spending. That's the that's the point. Welcome we're to paying, the party, pal. I mean, we're, 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 we're paying for a level of government spending. So I think it actually have the reverse impact. I think it would have the impact of making people more aware of how much we're spending because they're having to fund a portion of it and uh, and make them push back on that spending. That uh, the yesterday there was the discussion and there was the testimony on SGR six, which is the constitutional spending cap. I know you're going to want to try and get to that here in number three, but I mean that was one of the things that came up. The Economist and Ed King said, you know, you're talking about a tax on every Alaskan family between ten and thirteen thousand uh, dollars. When they start realizing that that's the amount of money that they're paying, regardless of their income level. That's significant. I mean, that's a huge amount of money. Oh, but but we don't worry. We don't pay taxes in this state. We do. We just don't see them. Yeah, and and see, that's the problem. The the, the P, that's one of the problems of the PFD cuts. It it is not a tax. It's not obvious to the top twenty percent that they're paying a tax because they're because the impact of PFD cuts is so small uh, as a percent of their income. So right. they're all for you know continue government spending because they don't have to. Uh, number two though has to do with. Oil taxes, because that is, of course, uh, the hue and cry of a lot of folks is that they're, you know, that there's money on the table that we're not getting our fair share. And uh, you and I disagree a little bit on the amount. Uh, I think it's a little higher rather than lower. But you also say that, um, you know, any going too far has a more deleterious effect than uh, than trying to grab that extra money. Here, here's the deal on, on oil taxes, Michael, I, the deal to me. And, and frankly, it's maybe the one area where I agreed with the Walker administration uh, uh, on on the issue. Last last year there was a bill up before the legislature. Uh, Paul Seaton had sponsored it. It was Bill four four one one or four four one. I forget the number right off the top of my head, but it, it was four one one House Bill four one one uh, to uh, uh, to increase uh, uh, to redo and increase oil taxes, and it had. It, 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 it made changes in a number of areas. Uh, one of them was the credits. The, the Walker administration, um, the, the Seton didn't have uh, an expert, uh, oil industry expert, oil tax expert, uh, as part of the testimony uh, on, the, on the bill. Um, I'm not sure he could find one that supported the changes he was, he was proposing to make. The Walker administration testified uh, on the bill and the final slide of their presentation uh, says this, the legislature appears to be reaching consensus on a partial fiscal plan relying on a structured use of permanent fund earnings. The apparent remaining budget gap will likely be in the 500 to $700 million range. The most appropriate mechanism to fill this gap is via a broad-based tax tied to the overall state economy. And that position from the Walker administration was based on a bunch of analysis that they had done and a bunch of discussion that had gone on in the previous two sessions. Oil and gas, and this is the next bullet point, oil and gas taxation should be based on fair share and related economic development issues, not budgetary need in any specific year. Major oil and gas tax changes should be backed by substantial analysis and review looking at both unique local factors as well as global comparables. Last year, this is the Walker, this is the Walker administration talking last year, so we're talking about two years ago. Two years ago, the legislature set in motion a process to revisit these fair share issues with the intention to use this to inform the next major tax rewrite. And the legislature went out and, and hired uh, three separate consulting firms to advise them uh, on oil taxes as part of that process. That's something the legislature had done uh, in 2017. Then the final bullet point from the Walker administration was this. Until the completion of the process set in motion last year, it may be premature to address a substantial tax revision at this time. The, 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 those consultants have been on uh, retainer uh, the last uh, two years. Um, they, are, they are being administered by uh, the Legislative Council, which is run by Senator Gary Stevens, of which Gary, Senator Gary Stevens is the chair. Uh, Gary Stevens is not a fan of the oil companies. He has been a fan in the past of uh, of, uh, of of changes to the to the tax structure. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, those consultants 
uh, have not come forth with a recommendation to make uh, major changes uh, in the tax structure. I can understand why that is. When you look at the 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 math uh, on on oil taxes, here's what's going on. Uh, oil companies get uh, get money for uh, the oil they sell. Uh, the FY18 price was about $63 a barrel. Uh, you multiply that multiply that by the number of barrels they produced. You get about $12 billion in gross value that the companies received uh, from the sale of oil. You have to deduct costs from that. The costs involved in getting that oil uh, out of the ground, getting it transported, and getting it uh, to the point of sale. That was about $5.6 billion of costs. I mean, we're on a net profit system. Uh, in Alaska, so you deduct costs before you start looking at what the tax uh, should be. That leaves about six billion dollars, six point four billion dollars, of net value uh, before you start considering taxes. Then you look at at the payments to Alaska uh, uh, out of that six billion dollars: production taxes, property taxes, royalties, uh, everything else. And the payments to Alaska uh, and in FY18 was about two point nine billion dollars. $2.9 billion out of the 6.4 is 45% of revenues, 45% of the net revenues after, after costs uh, that, the, that the companies are getting from uh, production of Alaska oil is going to the state. That's a pretty healthy chunk. Now, that's, that's not just production taxes, but, but, but in terms of the economics, oil economics, you don't look at just production taxes. You look at all of the tax structure. Uh, and all of the payments that you're that you're you're paying to the state uh, out of out of your gross revenue. So 45% of net revenues uh, are going to the state of Alaska. That's a pretty healthy chunk. I can understand why the consultants that the legislature have, ret have retained have evidently not recommended making significant changes uh, in the tax structure. If you're already getting 45% on a world scale. Uh, that's a that's a pretty uh, healthy take by uh, by government. One of the benefits that we've gotten out of SB 21, if you look at the at the uh, projections at the production charts and look at the projections uh, of where we've been, is we've had a fairly healthy increase over the or since SB 21 in investment levels and thus in production levels uh, that are going on in the state. If you look at the 2012, which was the which was the projections uh, made by the state uh, prior to the passage of uh, SB 21 in 2013. Uh, if you look at the production levels by 2020, by next year, we should have been, we we were going to be down to 395,000 barrels um, a day of production. If you look at what's happened since SB 21, um, and and this is during. Uh, a fairly low oil price environment since 2014, uh, the confirmation of SB 21 and the election in 2014, um, in, a, in a fairly low oil and price environment. If you look at what's happened, we've had a healthy increase in investment in Alaska, and we now have today uh, the projection for 2020 uh, is 530,000 barrels a day instead of 395,000 barrels a day. A picture, a pickup of over 100,000 barrels a day. Well, actually, 100, 135,000 barrels a day, um, uh, as a result of, or, or during the time period that SB 21's been in effect. Can, uh, if you look at the forecast going forward, uh, the, the the 2012 forecast had us going down to 339,000 barrels uh, by 2022. Uh, the actual, the the current projection is we're looking at 491,000 barrels. Uh, by 2022, if you look at the, if you look on out from there, we stay fairly flat at around the 490,000, 500,000 dollar, 500,000 barrel range uh, uh, going forward from uh, 2021 or 2021 out to 2028. The decline that we were on pre uh, SB 21 uh, would steep had a steepening and and had uh, significant declines going on. So, you know. The, the the thing about oil taxes is is it is it, it's not just a one shot deal. They're not like an ATM. Oil companies aren't like an ATM that you can just go tap when you want to, right? Um, and say we need more money. Oil it, it it's a complex uh, 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 analysis, 
done in the face of global competition. Dollars are dollars can be moved around. Investment dollars can be moved around. And the question is, what does it take to keep those investment dollars coming to Alaska, producing, uh, 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 maintaining production, uh, maintaining uh, revenue to the state of Alaska? And as I say, you know, I think the Walker administration had it right. You just don't mess around uh, with it uh, based upon the budgetary needs in any specific year. You want to be, you want, you want any changes to be backed by substantial analysis, and they've not come forward with any that, that suggests a change. Well, and this is, it's very complex, and that's part of the problem. But again, part of the complexity has to do with again being on, and you've mentioned it, the net oil tax per, portion of it. Um, I mean, we've got uh, you know producers who are writing off. Uh, you know, production costs, not just in Alaska, but elsewhere, which, again, some people are saying is definitely unfair to Alaskans, uh, you know, that there should be instead more of a wellhead tax or a direct, you know, production tax without the net effect. But what about that, Brad? I mean, the, this because, again, I think, you know, the fact that we can write off production costs from not just the Alaska units, but from around the world. I mean, of course, and we know that oil companies, I mean, I think net profit taxes are problem, uh, net profit taxes are problematic anyway. We've seen the same thing in the mineral industry where they've got a bunch, you know, they got a whole floor of sharp penciled accountants who can show you how they've lost money in every way. We've got one small division with a handful of people trying to keep a backlog of this stuff uh, and trying to audit and, you know, review all these returns. It becomes a losing battle for the state on this net profit scheme because, again, they can show where they've lost money everywhere and, and how they're not even making money in certain areas or new fields or things like that. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I think that needs to be the fundamental shift. It should just be you pay this much at the wellhead, and if you want to take it and go with it, then this is what – and it has to be a reasonable amount. And maybe for progressivity, uh, as the oil prices change – there's a progressivity factor on it, but it should be just a severance tax instead of this net profit tax. Well, Michael, two things. One, first of all, the, the Alaska system doesn't have a, a, doesn't allow you to write off exploration activity or exploration costs in other areas. Production uh, costs? Against, does, against does, the, against, does it we, allow we for production that. costs? Huh? Does it allow for production costs from other areas? No, no, not from outside Alaska. I mean, you can write off... Alaska production costs uh, activities in another in another field against your overall tax. I mean, we're not we're, we don't ring fence each field and calculate the cat the the tax separately on each field. Uh, we don't, uh, but we don't allow production costs from, for example, from Africa uh, to be included in the uh, in the Alaska calculation. Th there may be some confusion. We we also have a corporate income tax on oil companies, and the way the corporate income tax, at least Paul Seaton's view of it. The way the corporate income tax works, it does allow costs from other parts uh, of the world to be included in the calculation of the corporate income tax because you sort of you calculate a, 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 the total corporate income tax and then you allocate a portion of your total costs, your total income, and then you allocate a portion of it to Alaska. And Seton always argued that that allowed the write off of some costs from other places. But that's not how the production tax works. The production tax is tied to Alaska production costs. Uh, deducted from Alaska revenues, um, and that's the uh, and and that's the the basis for the calculation. Can can people with sharp pencils do sharp things? Yeah, but but here's the reason we went to a a cost based system uh, back in back in the Murkowski administration, which was confirmed. I mean, Aces was a cost based system, a net profit system. The reason we went to it is because Alaska costs are different than costs elsewhere in the world. You can't say that a 4% uh, gross tax uh, in Alaska is equivalent to a 4% gross tax in, in, in North Dakota, for example, because production costs in Alaska are so much higher than production costs uh, in, other, in other areas. And so, it's, and so the easier way to deal with it, um, it is subject to audit, uh, the easier way to deal with it uh, is to do it on a net profits basis as opposed to trying to do it on a gross basis. That way, you you capture the the fact that Alaska production costs are higher than elsewhere in the world, and then you tax on the profit that results from from Alaska production costs. The problem is is that we're perennially playing a game of catch up. Um, I mean, we've talked when I was on the borough assembly, I had a conversation with one of the attorneys there because they were in battles over taxation and things like that with the oil companies on the on the 
valuation of the land. And one of the discussions is always, I mean, that they've, they're have they perennially playing catch-up, and the Department of Revenue is doing the same thing because, you know, they've got a statute of limitations on these things. They can only go back so many years before it rolls off the books, and they just couldn't keep up. And it seemed like every year they would find something that the oil companies had tried to, you know, squeak by under the letter of the law, but where they owed more money – and it, it was just it, and, and they just never had enough people or enough time to go back over it and, and do it all, which I think is, again, leading people to say, OK, if the costs are different in Alaska, then maybe we take a different percentage at the wellhead or we account for that at the wellhead percentage instead of as a severance instead of a production tax and uh, instead of a, a net profits tax. And I think that's that's been the main problem. I mean, how much time are we spending chasing our tail when we could have been just, you know, flat, you know, hit it and quit it, know what we're going to get. And that's the end of it. Yeah, you can convert. I mean, you can convert a net profits tax into a gross tax. I mean, you can make the projections of what the costs are going to be uh, and what the margin is going to be and use that in the calculation uh, of the uh, of, of a gross tax. Uh, but that's not been, I mean, the experts that Alaska has used, the tax ex- experts that Alaska has used uh, uh, since the Murkowski administration, through the Palin administration, through the Parnell administration, through the Walker administration, and all the legislatures throughout all that, all of the all of the experts that have looked at Alaska's competitive position uh, uh, relative to other other investment opportunities elsewhere in the world have recommended the net profits tax because Alaska is so difficult to deal with on the cost side. So I, I mean, yes, you can, you can do it, but, but, but here's sort of the ultimate deal. The legislature has hired consultants to advise them on making those changes. And, and other than Willikowski, nobody's making noises about making changes and Bill's not making those noises based upon what the consultants have said. He's making noises, but just based upon uh, the, the proposal to strip out uh, what are called credits, but are really rate adjustments uh, in the existing tax. So, if there was, if there, I, I would, I, and particularly under a committee headed by Gary Stevens, if there was a basis to make a significant change, if Alaska was not getting its fair share, or if Alaska was not, if that 45% of revenues was not, uh, if you could get more and still and and still have Alaska competitive in the world, um, I, I I would think. That those that those consultants would be making the recommendation, yeah. the legislature would be mo- moving forward, particularly yeah. on the House side, which is not where, which is a which is a more Democrat-led uh, 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 organization than on the than on the Senate side. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for coming in, my friend. As always, good to speak with you, Michael. Thanks for having me. As always. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.